if you saw the Martian with Matt Damon, was it anywhere close to what uh, the survival training uh, is like? There's, I mean, yeah, it, <laughs> maybe not to that extreme. And uh, I yeah, don't suppose you train them how to grow potatoes. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, no, but uh, <laughs> yes. I think the, what, you, what you you have to train them is to have a good sense of humor. That's why he survived. Yeah, exactly. I, I think that's the key. That's the key. And that and that is like uh, I was mentioning with the astronaut candidate training at the extreme survival training that they do. It's you know how you know how was their demeanor during that time? You know, just upon themselves. How hard are they on themselves? How do they deal with it? You know, and. So all of that is something that uh, is already kind of thrown at them before they get into a mission like this. Three, two, and liftoff. Starliner is headed back to space. Hey, hey, welcome to Over the Horizon. This is turning out to be quite the year for uh, space flight and space exploration. We have the Boeing Starliner flight is the first crewed test flight that's set for the 6th of May. Uh, and I have uh, a couple of special guests lined up today for you on Over the Horizon. Let me bring in uh, Debbie Trainer. She's a retired space flight training manager at NASA, Johnson Space Center. And of course, also with me as usual, our uh, go-to guru for all things uh, aerospace, uh, robots, and mechanical engineering, Dr. Scott Walter. Welcome, both of you. It's great to have you on Over the Horizon. We've got a lot to talk about this uh, test launch. So first of all, Debbie, welcome. This is your first time on the podcast. Uh, yeah. You've been busy. You've just had a book published uh, in February, is it? Tell us a bit about it. Yes, that's correct. And uh, I'm uh, happy for this opportunity. Thank you so much for inviting me to participate. But, uh, but yes, in February, I... Uh, decided to go ahead and uh, publish this book. Uh, here it is, Tortillas to Astronauts, An Unexpected Journey. I never expected uh, as a young Mexican-American girl in Pasigit, Dandina, Texas, that uh, I would not only be training astronauts, but be the training manager for the first expedition to uh, the International Space Station. That's just that was just amazing. So I just felt like I needed to write down some of uh, the lessons learned along the way that I had getting across that uh, unexpected journey. So thank you. Okay. okay so um, you actually personally know both Sunni and Butch, the two uh, astronauts headed uh, to the ISS on the Boeing's Starliner. That's on the 6th of May. Um, tell us a bit about uh, what you know about these two uh, amazing people. They are both a great uh, choices for this first uh, this first launch. Uh, they're going to be great. I'm I'm sure of it. I first met Sunny when she was uh, what they um, would call a Russian crusader. <laughs> she she was uh, in the working in the astronaut office uh, doing a lot of uh, Russian negotiations for training and etc. Uh, while I was stationed there in Russia for a year at the Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center. So I've known a uh, trainee for uh, Sunny for, for quite a while, and then uh, especially worked with her when she was chief of the astronaut office, uh, um, when I was also in the astronaut office. And Butch I've known since he was uh, an astronaut candidate. So, <laughs> so he's definitely... Um, been another person that I've been able to know quite a bit. And uh, like I mentioned, I was a training manager for the first crew on the International Space Station. And when I retired, I took a picture of the, the last uh, of the crew that was training at that time to go to the space station. And Butch was uh, the crew member that <laughs> was my last crew for space station when I was working there. Wow, that's uh, quite a connection you have with this crew. They're both uh, Navy test pilots. So Correct. It's, yeah. um, it, I guess it's part of the rigor that uh, they've been through uh, in throughout their career, not just as astronauts in their own right, but also as Navy test pilots to be 
the ones to test this um, spacecraft. And they kept referring to it as a spacecraft rather than a vehicle in the press conference, uh, you know, the other day. It was very interesting to see that. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so um, this has been a, a long time in the making, hasn't it? Um, it's had a, a rather uh, controversial uh, development path. Uh, unfortunately, there's been a lot of delays. Uh, we heard both uh, Sunny and Butch talk about their roles uh, as astronauts in the feedback loop and um, uh, that it was, uh, you know, there were a lot of uh, suggestions that, you know, were made and discussed um, as the spacecraft uh, went through its own evolution. Um, but give us a sense of, you know, what it is um, to be an astronaut, first of all, um, to be test flying a spacecraft like this. Uh, yes, well, and, and a lot of times uh, when people think of the word astronaut, they're, they're thinking about that whole space quality, but it really is so much more than that. And <clears throat> there is, um, and they don't all have to come from a test uh, pilot background, of course, uh, because, uh, of course, the, they are the crew on board. And yes, they have a mission control to support them, but at any point they may have to do, uh, you know, whatever is necessary to keep uh, the vehicle, um, a spacecraft <laughs> worthy and communicate what needs to be done for the people on the ground as well. So it is uh, definitely an all encompassing role to be able to uh, react and respond in a calm and uh, thought out manner for whatever may present itself because it is definitely the unknown and they have to just be able to uh, keep their demeanor and their wits about them uh, with whatever may be thrown their way. Oh yeah, absolutely. I can just imagine. I, I actually, to be honest, I, I you know, it's I, I what I'd love you to tell us and for the benefit of viewers, is what exactly goes into the training process for a flight like this? And well, how different is it from every, from everything else, from a regular uh, you know, trip to the ISS? Uh, well, yes, for sure. This is something that, uh, and it's kind of like when um, I was a crew, uh, the training manager for the first crew for the space station, was it was our first even though we had tested all the equipment on the ground and each partner had done their own simulations of communication, it was going to be the first real, let's see, is this really going to work the way we had anticipated to work, you know? And, and that is one thing that uh, I tell you, uh, when I was first getting my degree and trying to decide where I wanted to work at the Johnson Space Center, and I talk to the people in this spaceflight training world, it really is just an amazing job because you can, you throw everything possible at the crew so that they are, you know, prepared, you know, that uh, when some uh, anomaly comes up, it's going to probably be less than everything that the training team has thrown at them already so that they're calm, they're able to work through it. And uh, so it's just, we, we know it, it, it would be great if everything ran perfectly, but since it is the first time, there is probably going to be some bumps. And that is what, as a training team, we try to make sure that they're able to be calm and can handle it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I kind of, I was a bit surprised when I, I was watching the press conference and I, I was a bit surprised when when Butch mentioned that, you know, this is the spacecraft is unique because it has, you know, these three different modes, the automatic manual and a backup mode. Um, and then that really uh, gives them, you know, it built in so many redundancies and it gives them so many options. Um, so if you can help us understand a bit about, you know, what these modes are and, and what is so special about the Starliner. Which, by the way, has been uh, named Calypso by Sunita. 
Oh, wow. I didn't, I didn't get that information yet. Yeah, that's pretty cool. But, uh, but yeah, and that is definitely something uh, across the program that we're going to see that uh, now we have commercial crew, uh, commercial uh, companies making these. So SpaceX is designed different than Boeing Starliner. So, and uh, yes, and obviously, you know, Butch and Sunny were both uh, shuttle astronauts as well. So it's also configured differently than what they saw in shuttle. So yes, it's getting used to what um, the you know the their crew area is going to look like is different than what they were used to. So adjusting to that, and uh, obviously it'll be different once they're on the space station as well. But they've both been to the space station, so that'll come back probably like right, riding a bike. But you know, but for now, this uh, Boeing Starliner, <laughs> yeah, this Boeing Starliner is uh, is going to be quite new. So. The training that they put in is that's where it's going to come into play. So, Scott, from an aerospace engineering perspective, I mean, it's so important to have these redundancies built into any spacecraft, right? Um, and you need to be able to, you know, abort right through the entire launch, um, you know, the launch process, right from from the pad to the time that you know you're in space. You need to have backup plans. Um, just. Help us understand how you know these things work and why are they so key? I mean, I mean, obviously safety is paramount, you know, mm -hmm. but the the evolution of a uh, of 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 these of these systems is really challenging. Yes, and um, before I do that, I guess I, I have one question for for Debbie, and that is, um, did NASA choose you for the job, or did you choose the job because your last name was a perfect fit? <laughs> 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 it uh, ironically enough, it's really crazy that uh, uh, so I actually started working at NASA. My last name was Ramos. And then I uh, re got the trainer name uh, right a year before I got my degree. And so, like I said, when I did the interviews, I ended up in training and it just happened to be yeah a year after I got the trainer name. I was a, tra a trainer. <laughs> Just so happy. I was I was expecting Scott to to ask you this. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. We yeah. are in the simulation, Scott. And uh, yes, and, and yeah, I'm, exactly. I'm, I'm, I'm divorced now, but even my ex agrees. You know, and I said, hey, you know, I still plan to do public speaking, and he says, yeah, you can keep the name. <laughs> so. <laughs> so examples of the simulation is I'll never forget when I saw the movie Robocop. And the, the person that designed it, his name was actually Rob Button. <laughs> and, and I thought, oh, that's like a made up name or it's a company name. No, no, it's his actual name. <laughs> so, it's, wow. it's like, so sometimes the name really does fit the, the, you know, the uh, what you do, your occupation. Yeah. Uh, and one other thing I'll, I'll kind of bring up as, as a piece of trivia is uh, it turns out that, that SUNY and I went to the same high school. Oh, oh wow. just seven years apart. You know, I, I graduated oh, wow. way before she did. But yes, they, they list her as a native of Needham, Massachusetts, even though she was um, born in Euclid, Ohio. And of course, Euclid is like a perfect name for anyone who's a, you know in the sciences and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. But yeah. yeah, just a little piece of trivia there. Um, but yes, you, you're right. So you know, ever since the early days of uh, space exploration, redundancies have been built in right from the very beginning. You know, and you can even look at it in um, in a lot of advanced aircraft. You know, what could they do to make sure there was an, an abort in there uh, all along there? So there are always these systems that you would think of like redundancies as well as methodologies. And I'm sure, you know, Debbie can talk about this of like, what do you do when this fails? What, what's the potential alternative? What's the solution to that? So the first thing a pilot does when they take off and they're in the air, they are trained to look for a place to land constantly, you know, you're just always looking and imagining it's like, if something goes wrong well, right now, what's a contingency? And you're constantly trained and trained and trained and trained to do that. And to think of what all the backup systems are. And the other thing in aerospace is that you're constantly trying to get like a dual purpose out of any part. Anything you have in there, if you can find a second use for it, that's kind of nice. And sometimes that also plays into the redundancy. So it's like, well, this is its main purpose. But you know what? If we really need to, we can also use it for uh, another purpose over here. So you're constantly thinking of that because 
in many cases, that's the only way you can reduce mass overall is you just got to make sure that rather than having two different parts, if the same part can do the same function or do a backup function, it'll be there. And a lot of the other is not necessarily that you're putting in hardware systems that are redundant, but you're putting in procedures that are redundant. You're thinking about what do I do when something goes wrong? And that's all part of it in many ways why, you know, the training is so important because the first thing you want to do is completely desensitize the astronauts to any situation. So when they actually see it for the first time, they're so calm and relaxed. And that's basically what the Mercury astronauts went through. For the most part, their flights were anticlimactic because they had gone through so much. They just said, oh, I was expecting more. <laughs> <laughs> and, right, and, that, right. and that was the whole point. That's a successful training program is when they say the actual flight is boring compared to uh, everything you were going through in, in the simulations and the training. Right, exactly. Yes, yes. As a matter of fact, in the space station days, you know, on the space station, there's three command and control, um, the command and control programs that, that they're, they're the main, there's three of them for redundancy, right? And uh, one of the training scenarios was that two of those were going to go down. And after the myriad of going through that sim, uh, the crew uh, that was uh, under that situation, they kind of commented, hey, that's a little, okay, we know you got to throw everything at us, but that's extreme. And ironically enough, to the two CNC oral use, they, they did go down on their flight. So they knew they, but they were able to handle it, you know? So. <laughs> so, so, so I have to ask you that in your training simulations, do you, do you have a, a Kobayashi Maru simulation uh, situation for them? <laughs> <laughs> and, and for those who aren't familiar with Star Trek, do you want to explain that? Oh yeah, well, and uh, just, uh, yeah, uh, and you're, you're right. There, there is. Uh, we certainly have, and that's one of the things that I love uh, when we were talking before the podcast that. Uh, it's it just the environment of people that work in space. You, you, it's just the passion. And of course, there's a whole Star Trek people world and Star Wars people world. And yes, and we all kind of uh, sometimes acronyms are specifically made so they can fit one of those things. <laughs> Where we can't try to fit them in. <laughs> So I have to ask: Have have you in your in your careers had any <laughs> astronaut wanting to bail? It just gets too tough. Uh, and I'm sorry. Without I, taking I, names. Yes, yes, no, no. There, uh, the astronauts, of course, you know, the selection process to be an astronaut is extreme. So you know, by the time they have become uh, an astronaut candidate, that's the they are really those that truly want to be there. They understand what the challenges are, uh, not just uh, mentally, but physically, and especially if they have family, what the drain it could yeah. be on their family. It is it is quite the endeavor, and uh, so uh, so yes, that that the, any astronaut that they they're going to go a hundred and ten percent. You know, so it, it's that's just the way it is. Yeah, I, in fact, I, I asked you this because uh, both Sony and and uh, Butch made a reference to it. It was one of the first questions asked to them, uh, asked to them in this press conference because this is a test flight, and there are, you know, there are. I would imagine the risks are far greater in some ways, and um, to prepare not just yourself psychologically and physically mentally for this, but also your your family members and your loved ones, because, you know, although you everybody tries and prevents the worst case scenario from becoming a reality, you can't rule it out. And I guess that's that sort of a risk is part and parcel of of what um, these brave people do. Exactly. So. Yes, I know. I know. Yeah, I um I don't know why what comes to mind is a meeting I was in one time where there was a discussion about a change of procedure that had what to do with an EVA and uh, and the rationale for changing this procedure, you know, and, and the reason it was coming up to this big discussion point was there was some risk involved and some potential hazards to the crew member that would be doing the EVA. 
And, um, but the, um, of course, the biggest question is why? Why does this change need to be made? What is the benefit of making this change and putting the astronaut at risk? And, you know, there, there wasn't a really good uh, answer. So the astronaut was like, you know, if you're telling me to make this, to risk everything because I'm going to be saving the space station and they're saving, you know, saving the world, you know, I, I will do it. But if you're telling me to take this risk because it's going to cause, it's going to make less time on the ground for somebody in mission control, that's saving time is not worth the risk versus saving the space station. So, um, so yes, yeah, so of course, you have to weigh all of that into it. One of the, the reporters asked them about, um, you know, the, the, the long and arduous process of the development of this, of the Starliner and why it's taken them, I mean, taken the program so long, so long to reach this point. Um, and as part of that, you know, a question was asked to both Sunita and, and, um, and both about what sort of feedback um, that both of them uh, had given as part of this process of evolution developing the spacecraft and but said that you know for as far as he was concerned it, there was one point that he'd raised was about the the voicing the need to avoid black zones and hit the bullseye on landing um you know and, and that became very important because it could really make the difference between a safe um landing and, and a, a not so optimal landing that could risk their lives can you maybe help us understand a bit about this, both the process of, of uh, and you know, the involvement of astronauts in, in pre preparing for such a flight and also what this means, what Butch meant? Yes, I mean, uh, and actually I have an example of what happens when it doesn't land where it should is, you know, um, we did have a ballistic return from one of the Soyuz uh, entries uh, for a crew member. And um, it was so far off that the rescue uh, people were not able to get there in the normal time. They did get there, of course. But in the meantime, uh, the local people where the spacecraft landed obviously not being trained on how to properly uh, remove the crew. They, you know, were just trying to help and, and remove the crew, but not necessarily in the safest way to remove the crew from the, from the capsule. So, uh, so yeah, it is very important that, um, the crew try to land in the, yeah. the zone that is previously planned for, you know, avoiding um, hitting anybody, you know, just, there's just several uh, reasons of why those zones are, are put there, you know, very knowledgeable people make sure that they have all of that together. And so, of course, you want to try to hit that as close as you can. Are they able to evacuate themselves uh, on landing or do they have to wait? For Boeing Starliner, I'm not sure. I, I would imagine so. I, I would imagine, uh, you know, f even back from shuttle days uh, after, you know, the Challenger accident, the crew escape from the vehicle was something that has always been big on uh, space program's mind. So I would imagine that that is probably a, a possibility, but I don't know for sure. Right. Yeah. 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 Usually you want all the systems safe first before you do it. And yeah, I can understand landing in a remote area where the villagers come out and they don't understand the dangers of hypergolics and everything else. And like, you know, you don't want to be near the spacecraft because of all the toxics are there. So they were actually putting themselves more in danger than probably the, 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 the astronauts or cosmonauts on board. Yeah, so you need to avoid that uh, for yeah. sure. Um, I, do, you, do you have any idea when the second test would be if this one goes successful? Uh, no, I'm sorry. I did not. I don't re if that if I got that information, I didn't retain it. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, I was yeah. just I mean, at this point, no one probably knows, you know, it's like because mm -hmm. they, they have to make sure everything went exactly the way they wanted before they would go ahead. And and uh, is the Starliner um, maximum four or six? 
or the, the crew size? It's supposed to be, I believe, up to five. Up to five. Okay. Oh, that's a strange number. Yes. But actually, it's a, it's yeah. a lucky number in yeah. Japanese. I, so, <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I think uh, I think you know part of it is that you know it could be a combination of crew and cargo as well. You know, mm -hmm. right, right, right. Now, I think one of the big questions I don't know if, if you can address this is that um, the launch vehicle right now is the Atlas, but the the Atlas is, program is basically ended. So, I'm not sure how many more there are available for it. Do you know how difficult it will be to? Uh, fit this onto a different launch vehicle. And I assume there must be plans to do it. And that probably would change the training procedures as well. Right. It, I'm, I'm sure it would. Uh, I don't know uh, what other vehicles uh, they are looking at right now. Uh, but yes, I'm sure that there is a whole team that is looking at the pros and cons of one versus the other and, uh, and who's available to step up and take over. Yeah, I, I assume I would always pick the vehicle and the one that looks less funny because it, it just seems like really strange. It's like get something that's a bit more streamlined, you know, find the one with the same diameter and pop it on there. Right, right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it must be good. I mean I, I would imagine it's it's a great uh plus a bonus to have you know a, a second um spacecraft a second type of spacecraft ready for these missions. There was a time when you didn't have American astronauts la launching from American soil until Dragon uh, uh, came out on the scene, and then now you've got Boeing Starliner. So it's looking a lot better for um, the American space industry and for NASA's um, plans, isn't it? Yes, yes, definitely. I mean, it's. Uh, I think it's just so great that there's uh, more commercial companies out there. Uh, it can just only help us, you know, so it, it's it's really a, a nice positive um, atmosphere right now. And I just hope it continues. Hmm. So I'm just curious to know, um, Debbie, because you have this background, uh, such an extensive background in astronaut training uh, in the program, um, looking ahead, at, at at Artemis and the and the moon missions and moon landings, how different is it um, in in terms of the training program when when you're training for the ISS versus um, let's say a mission a moon mission? Right, uh, and um, yes, it's it's going to be different because you know especially you know once we get to uh, you know Artemis three where they actually land uh, on the lunar surface. You know, uh, as a matter of fact, I was just recently in Japan. Um, I uh, my so my daughter works for Artemis, <laughs> so the Gateway pro, uh, program was having some um, meetings there because you know it's it's going to be a new world now of actually getting on the lunar surface, and so geology is uh, something that's going to be added in and. Uh, and actually, the the 2009 astronaut candidate class that I was uh, responsible for as their training manager, uh, they were the first uh, class astronaut candidate class that we added more geology information in there, uh, going back to like the Apollo days. And and as a matter, I believe the Johnson Space Center is going to be start trying to do another lunar. A yard for simulations and et cetera, as they did back in the Apollo days. So, so there are some changes. And then uh, there was also a rover team that was in Japan as well with some meetings to discuss all of that. So, um, so there's definitely some new apps that uh, we have not dealt with in, in a while, but there are several teams um, knowledgeable that are working on all of it to prepare us for that. Yeah, and you know we've we've heard so much um, about the impact of of you know the be living in microgravity for extended periods of time, um, you know just adapting to a, the lunar surface, and we're not even talking about Mars, but just the lunar surface would have its own challenges, right? And to be right. able to to live and work there in in a you know in a in a habitat for astronauts would have its own own set of challenges what what are what sort of these what are the biggest challenges in adapting um 
to an environment like the lunar surface? And how do you how do you begin training for that? Well, and actually, at the space center now, they have uh, uh, lessons learned from. Um, they have done very, and right now there's an actual crew, mock crew that simulate being on Mars for a, a certain amount of time. So, uh, so they, the astronauts, and actually, you know, the astronaut candidates, they, it's always been in their training flow to do extreme uh, survival training, and and that is part of it, not only just of the extreme of the environment but also mentally in the preparation for what that means to be in some type of extreme environment, not only for the person themselves, how they, they, they uh, bond as a crew and you know, can manage things as a crew uh, in extreme environment. So there's different aspects that go into it uh, on top of the technical and physical that's required for all of that. Yeah, and uh, if you saw The Martian with Matt Damon, was it anywhere close to what uh, the survival training uh, is like? There's, I mean, yeah, it, <laughs> maybe not to that extreme. And uh, yeah, I don't suppose you train them how to grow potatoes. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, no, but uh, <laughs> yes. Some I think what, you, what you, you have to train them is to have a good sense of humor. That's why he survived. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I think that's the key. That's the key. And that and that is like uh, I was mentioning with the astronaut candidate training at the extreme survival training that they do. It's you know how you know how is their demeanor during that time? You know, just upon themselves. How hard are they on themselves? How do they deal with it? You know, and. So all of that is something that uh, is already kind of thrown at them before they get into a mission like this. That's one of the assignment uh, as a chief of the astronaut office will look at, you know, when assigning things. Of course, these are, uh, you know, with the commercial companies, that's I'm sure that's what they're looking at as well. Yeah, sure. you know, in one of... In, in one of our earlier um, conversations, uh, we were talking about colonizing Mars and SpaceX's plans, Elon Musk's plans to colonize Mars. And uh, I remember Scott and I uh, and, and Ozan and, and uh, Ben Inouye was with us uh, from NASA JPL. We were talking about, you know, what it would take um, in terms of us, you know, um, the the psychological challenge and the mental challenge to to take a long trip to Mars um, without any any uh, you know guarantee that you would maybe come back. Essentially, a one way trip. And what sort of people would would have the right profile? And Scott said, you know, people who. Scott, tell us what you what you said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, basically, I'm looking at it is that for very short trips where um, you know flying the spacecraft is extremely important. That's your astronaut typically wants to be a jet jockey. I mean, they're that's that's what they do. They they love doing that kind of thing, but I'm just trying to imagine this. Like, oh, okay, we just need them for the first couple hours to point us in the right direction of Mars, and then they're going to be redundant from then on. You know, maybe they help us land it, but you're probably going to have automated systems. And once they're there, there's like almost no need because there's like no flying that needs to be done. And so most of your crew is really going to be you know scientists who already do not mind like going to Antarctica. And, and wintering over there and doing everything else. And they don't really mind being away from their family. So you're really getting at two very, very different personalities that would go in there. And I'm just not sure the astronaut jet jockey is, is really going to be a good fit for such a long trip like that, because that's going to be the last time they ever fly. You know, <laughs> it's like, yeah. are they really to, ready to, yeah. to kind of have their wings clipped like that? And the, the other thing is, is the way I think about what, what you have to do is you have to imagine you're going to go from a very nice environment and you're going to put some, some people in a Winnebago and make them drive around the country for nine months. And they're never allowed to, to leave the Winnebago at all. You know, <laughs> that's just it. They're just driving around. They're never allowed to leave. Everything they need is in there. And then eventually their destination is going to be some tundra way up in Northern Canada. <laughs> okay. And then it's like, it, and that's it. That's, that's where you're going to go. And, you know, just imagine, could anyone, 
do a trip like that. And I don't care whether your Netflix subscription is up to date and everything like that. After nine months, you're going to be going bonkers being in that Winnebago the whole time, not being able to come out. And at least you get to see the, you know, the landscape going by, but you're going to be in, in darkness for a long period of time. So it takes people of a certain kind of fortitude and outlook in life. And they may not be the people that, let's say, are the best around a camera or the best public speakers because they're probably kind of recluses. <laughs> so it's going to be really hard. How do, you, how do you get the public on board? The, the interesting aspect yeah. is going to be that, you know, the, the type of person that may be psychologically suited for this is not necessarily the, the person that is going to be the, the best in public. And, you know, as, as an astronaut trainer, I imagine, you know, there's this delicate balance between someone who is like the most fit for the mission and someone who's good from the public relations standpoint and trying to get the mixture between the two, because the public has to be on board. You want them to be there. And um, as a trainer, what is it? Are you trying to look for things like that? Or are you also trying to coach them on things like that, that to, to realize that it's not just about them. It's not just about the mission. It's also about the public that's going along for the ride. And what is it they need to do to sort of make sure they all feel a part of the process? Yes. I mean, it's, you know, and the, as part of the astronaut candidate training that they, they are all trained. Uh, some are obviously going to be better at public speaking. Some not so much, you know, that's maybe not their personality, as you mentioned, you know, but they all receive that, you know, uh, and, and it's across the board. That's what basic, it's two years of basic training to get, you know, the pilots to understand medical terminology and the doctors to understand avionics and et cetera. So it's that whole balancing act to make sure because they, uh, when they do present in the public, and of course the public just sees an astronaut, they, they don't, you know, and they might automatically think, like you said, you know, jet jockey, but that's not what they are. Uh, so the they have to be kind of a jack of all trades uh, because mm -hmm. that's what the public is basically expecting. But the, for the most part is if they're on a crew, you know, the, that crew makeup is specifically so that they can balance each other out for one to bring, you know, bring up for the other. So it's all how they mesh as a crew. So not one individual is on uh, track, you know, to kind of hold the whole, you know, to, for the public to be aware that just focus on that one. It's as a team, how they present themselves. And that yeah. that's something that is, is always uh, been part of training is the fact that everybody is part of a team and then not just the crew, but the mission control team, all of the, you know, medical people that help them. It, it is just such uh, for any mission that goes up, there are hundreds of people behind the success of that mission. And every astronaut is ingrained in them to be aware of the reality that, yes, you are the face, but it is not just about you. Yeah. yeah. And, and the one thing to point out is that in this mission, those two astronauts you know, are it, jet jockeys. It's about for our, our our, our agency, our, our government, yes, exactly, yes, yeah. and uh, and uh, I, um, yeah, I, I actually did. Uh, so, whether you keep this in or not, I'll leave that up to you. But <laughs> I, there was an astronaut that came into my office. We were responsible for a group of, uh, uh, you know, you know, freshman astronauts, basically. Uh, and uh, we were going to have a trip to uh, Washington, D.C. and NASA headquarters. And um, this astronaut came into my office and said, we've been invited to go to, you know, this event. Um, I need you to tell me that we don't have time to do it. And I said, well, um, I looked at it and I said, well, actually, we, we do have time to do it. I don't want to put on, it was, you know, this fancy to do thing. I don't want to put on a monkey, you know, just going on and on it, you know, it just, if you want a hobnob, that's you. But I said, no, it's not about me. It's not about you. It's not even about these freshman astronauts we're taking. It's about the fact that this agency has asked the NASA agency to attend. 
where that's you have to look at it at that level if we turn it down it's like nasa as an agency is saying no to this agency and it was yeah. at a government level and hey so then the astronaut was like all right all right all right and so we went and then at that event uh the astronaut came up to me and said you're right it's a good thing we came <laughs> Yeah, but just looking at um, Sunni and Butch, and especially since you you know both of them personally, and you worked with them, um, mm -hmm. help us understand the dynamic um, between these two. Um, and you know, and, yeah, go on. And before you answer that question, there's just one other piece of trivia that I want to put in here. Uh -huh. Do you know what the Needham High School mascot is? What they're called? You don't have to answer it right now, but think about it. It's appropriate. Okay. Huh? <laughs> Go on. Tell us. <laughs> it's the Needham High Rockets. Ah. <laughs> we weren't well, the Bulldogs or anything like that. It was the Needham High School <laughs> oh. Rockets. Yep. Blue oh, gold. my God. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that's oh, where very... she's a graduate. Yes. Absolutely appropriate. Yeah. Yes. Oh man, so she was destined from the beginning. From the yeah. beginning, right. yes. It was written so, in the stars. Yeah. <laughs> right. And right. In the yeah. But yes, but but they are definitely a good pair uh together and uh you know balance each other out. Um, you know, I Sunny's definitely um very focused and uh, they're both very focused in their own lanes you know and uh of course you know one stoic and going to look at everything and the other might be a little bit more <laughs> boisterous and let's go you know but so they yeah. balance each other out and, yeah. i and think sunny's Sonny's the the more boisterous one. At least that's what I made <laughs> out from the press conference because Butch was Butch was like, you know, hang on, hold your horses, let's not get away. <laughs> so they they do. I mean, they're a great crew together, and yeah. uh, I'm sure it's going to go great. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, mm -hmm. all right. It, you know, I think uh, we'll leave it at that uh, for for this conversation. It's been wonderful. Uh, having you on uh, make your debut on Over the Horizon, uh, Debbie. Um, let me just pull up your your social media profile. Well, it's a, you're on LinkedIn. You can reach out to her, and of course, uh, you also have uh, Scott Walter going ballistic five on X. Thank you both of you, uh, especially you, Debbie. Thank you for yes, uh, sparing the time. It's been wonderful chatting with you. And uh, uh, again, a shout out to uh, everybody who's, who's watching. Go buy Debbie's book. Yes, thank yes, you. Absolutely. And go <laughs> that, Rockets. That, that, and go Rockets. <laughs> yes, yes. All right. Yeah, thank All you right. so much for having me participate. I appreciate it.